Before we get started today, I want to take a moment to acknowledge the tragic deaths this week of two amazing professional wrestlers, Terry Funk and Bray Wyatt. Um, both are beloved by the wrestling community and will certainly be missed. Um, my deepest condolences to their families during this difficult time. I also wanted to share a quote from Bray that I think encapsulates very well why I love professional wrestling and why I talk about it so much in the context of creating a better world. He stated in a social media post, in part, In a world surrounded by hate, greed, and violence, a world where closure may never come, we all know a place that has hot and cold hope on tap, for better or for worse. This is the Fixer Punk Podcast, the podcast that would rather judge somebody based on their body of work rather than how their body looks, as Adam Cole would say. And no, having abs does not give you the automatic right to say that someone is better than you, baby. I'm Grayson Peltier. So today I want to discuss this story that's been making the rounds about a boss who allegedly would fire any employee of his who doesn't have a six-pack. Um, and this guy is pretty much the definition of late-stage capitalism in many ways. He is a car sales trainer, of all things. He's not a he apparently he has a fitness business, but his main business is sales training programs for car salespeople. And he made headlines. There was a story in the New York Post. Headline is, I'm a boss who fires anyone without six-pack abs. I have high standards. Um, which is just a crazy story in and of itself. Um, but it actually ties into a broader trend that I have been seeing that there is this sort of aesthetic and this kayfabe of success bros and successful people. We talked a bit about the ties between uh, success and and health optimization in the prior episode. But in terms of aesthetics specifically, there has been this sort of push to associate a very specific type of physique with success and being wealthy and it's not the bigger larger bodybuilder type it's a rather specific very aesthetic very lean physique that is pretty difficult to obtain without specific help there are people that can do it of course um but it is a lot more difficult than the than just the straight up thinner look or the much bigger look that requires you to put on more fat in order to put on more muscle. It's this very specific type of physique that is now becoming associated with success. And it ties back into a lot of this stuff we've been talking about around around discipline and almost an asceticism because obviously getting that lean, getting down to a very low body fat percentage is it's a very difficult thing, but it's also a thing that's very socially determined. Um, and this boss and what he's doing, is, obviously his organization is very, very focused on an image of success because that's what he's selling. He's telling people that they can, these car salespeople who buy this sales training program, that they can join his mastermind program or his inner circle mentorship, so he calls it, to earn upward of nine figures a year and he's charging a fee of $1,500 for the uh, one-time membership and then $499 a month to access this knowledge. Um, some of the reviews I've seen online of this program were not so flattering. There are a few positive ones, um, but overall people are not, there are a lot of people that are not quite satisfied with this guy's program. His name is Andy Elliott um, and his his whole thing, it, it's it, it's very similar to a lot of the types of success speakers you see, um, but just on this new level that ties into toxic masculinity and ties into a lot of interesting social norms. 
um, wherein the specific fitness level and the specific physique you've achieved and specifically the metric being a six pack. It's not even like the typical corporate wellness thing of where they're looking to see that you're reducing your weight, that you're, that you're doing things for the sake of saving the company money on, on healthcare. This is a whole different variety of things that we're seeing. And obviously this is, this guy is making it super, super explicit. And I think he's doing this partially for attention from the media um and you can tell from some of his some of his remarks to the post that it, it's probably that way or in the in the wash in the new york post article um but it's it's a very explicit way of stating what i've been seeing sort of implicitly um is that you have this certain portrayal of success that for men in particular, that has this very specific lean physique and that that is associated with a level of discipline. So what he's saying here um, in this article, he says, um, Mr. Andy Elliott here um, says, quote, if you get hired on in our company, you, you got a certain amount of time to get your body in shape or it shows me you don't care. I mean, I've got one, a six pack, 90% of my team has one, And you know, if I say get a six pack, my team understands what I mean. I can just grab any of my people and before a meeting, I can say, all right, shirts off, look around. Who's the most disciplined one in the room? So they, yeah, they are ascribing almost a morality to this. And I think that this is the new frontier of of, of poor shaming is fat shaming or just straight up physique shaming. Um, and to me, obviously this screams sexual harassment lawsuit saying, grab and take, grab somebody, take their shirt off, um, in a meeting about car sales of all things, or of sales training for calls for car sales. But he basically says that, um, says that he doesn't he doesn't really care and that this is for the 1% of people who are going to be successful that if you're the kind of person who would sue over this that you don't matter to him and yes there's this exclusivity there is this better than you mentality around this specific form of fitness this specific aesthetic vein of fitness has more of honestly more gatekeeping and a lot more exclusivity than bodybuilding powerlifting combat sports, any of the other disciplines, the specific focus on aesthetics. And you can tell that a lot of times even in the messaging of the brands that promote this in terms of fitness. Like some of them will have very exclusive coaching applications, make it seem very exclusive and very elusive. This very this specific, moderately muscled up, I think probably if you want to, obviously podcasting is an audio me- uh, medium, not a visual medium, or else I'd be able to put pictures up on the screen. Um, but I guess you can say probably if you're thinking about famous people, you can think of a lot of famous ripped actors, probably archetype, you'd think maybe Cristiano Ronaldo. Um, but some of these programs of course have, uh, actually these programs always have a bunch of transformation photos of people that are at a very lean level. Um, but, but what he's saying here is he, he says my entire company, my entire team, if you don't have a six pack, you don't work for us. Um, and says it's called a standard. How about we raise them? How about you guys quit get getting civilized and quit settling? <laughs> it's like what it's all these motivation motivational mumbo jumbo that literally means nothing. Um, and he says, "quote There are some people in this room that said they would sue their company if they told them they had to have a six pack." We know you would sue. That conversation is for the 1%. It wasn't for you. Yeah, it's this exclusivity. And this is actually a big part of, and part of the reason why I'm calling this kayfabe is because a concept I discussed a little bit actually late last year when around the time MJF won the AEW World Championship um, is this is kayfabe, which which is basically wrestling storytelling term to describe wrestling storytelling and the way they portray things in wrestling shows. Um, because the, and, and this typology of it, I have described as heel populism. So a heel is a villain. Um, and of course, populism is populism. So he is talking to a group of people 
who likely have some sort of issue in their economic state. People who are not selling as well or want to sell more in cars. Um, I don't know if he has sales training for other professions. I just uh, it just seems like his main area of focus is cars, is car salesmen. Um, which obviously you don't necessarily think of car salesmen and fitness. It doesn't really. It's not the first thing you think of. Again, this isn't somebody that's selling personal training. Um, we're not sales training specifically for personal training. Um, and you have and you have this person who is supposedly going to help you. So he's saying that if somebody calls him, he says, if a guy calls me and goes, Andy, I want to make more money today, I'm going to say, do me a favor, go get a gym pass, check back with me in a month. If you're still working out, if you're still showing up five days a week, if you're, eat, you're eating clean, I'll let you buy a coaching program. So he's like, okay, he is providing the hope to the downtrodden person who needs to make more money to get them into the 1%, but he's still fostering an adversarialism between you and your members of the fellow of your of your class because most likely struggling car salespeople most of them are not going to be able to achieve this goal and the thing is we don't think enough about how physique and stuff like this is socially determined we already know that obesity health problems diabetes all these things are determined by social context um if you're in a very high stress job you're more likely to binge eat have those types of issues if you're not making money you're you're not as much you're not able to ba- pay for healthier foods you are certainly not able to pay for specialized coaching and all kinds of other things and people are probably spending unfortunately I don't know specifically about this program but I know that a lot of times with these success programs people will spend their last dollar on these types of things in the hopes that these success gurus will get them to where they want to be in life and be their their hope um and also what this is also doing the sort of conditioning behind this is that he is also in my opinion doing a bit of a loyalty test um getting to that level getting to that very low body fat percentage level he's saying here like if 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 check back with me in a month um and you're a month and you're you're probably you're not going to get a six pack in in a month unless you're very very close to that level already um but the enormous sacrifice needed to get down to that level of body fat and it is the thing is that people think people will see somebody that is extremely lean especially photos on instagram and things like that very lean muscular definition the full six pack showing and they'll think oh yeah that person is at the peak of their athleticism and even like bodybuilders on stage no that person is in many cases that person is is extremely weak and depleted and they and it and at that point somebody they they're they, they've done a lot of very very difficult things that are going to make them pretty vulnerable actually at that point there i've i've saw a story of a guy on tiktok who said that he fell into a depression after he got down to stage lean levels for a bodybuilding show um but what the what he might be really testing here for obviously i can't read minds um but what he could be testing for is sort of a blind obedience to him as a leader he could be this Andy Elliott could be like, okay, if they're willing to do this very, very difficult thing for me, then they'd be willing to follow me blindly and do whatever I say. It could be a litmus test for that while also feeding into that kayfabe, that look of what he wants to portray out there as success. And of course, of course, he... um uh, he got some criticism. There are some people who rightly called him out on it. Um, somebody made fun, said, can't work for me if you're bald, grow hair or get out. Um, and then another one um, made a very good point as well. Somebody who said, man, I served in the Marines for 13 years with some absolute savages. I mean, true savage professionals who are smart, tactically sound, strong, loyal, courageous, and in unbelievable shape as demonstrating combat 
didn't have a six pack. Exactly. Um, it, it's probably getting down to an extremely lean level is probably detrimental to athletic performance in some cases. Even MMA fighters who have to be depleted out in order to make weight, you will occasionally see somebody like in the UFC or Professional Fighters League. Um, you will see somebody who sometimes has less than a six pack, still in great shape. Some of them will even have like a sizable amount of, of abdominal fat. Um, and that doesn't really tell you that much about how how athletic they are in certain ways. And he's saying also that like, oh yes, feeding into again the old toxic masculinity narrative. He's saying, well, it's because these men are so weak and so soft and they won't be able to defend their families. Now, that's not that that that's just not the case. Having a six pack is not really a, as good of a metric. It's a metric that you're working out and you're training really, really hard. But not having one doesn't mean that you're not able to defend your family. You take a guy like John Moxley from AEW, former AEW world champion, um, really good professional wrestler, also um, competes in jujitsu tournaments. He doesn't quite have a six pack, but I have. No doubt whatsoever that John Moxley would be able to defend his family in a physical confrontation. But again, it's this it's this image that they are portraying. And in this article, there is an image right here of his group of people, or his, I guess his team, um, standing there on stage in black shirts with their arms crossed in front of them with him in, um, in front of a white shirt. And I looked at this and I'm like immediately, wrestling faction. This is a wrestling faction. They are portraying a specific image. And if you're, you're either in with them or you're out with them, you have a team that has a matching image to them. And of course, yeah, it's definitely conformity. Um, and But the thing is, is that, is that yeah, it, it shows that the people who are willing to do anything to work for this guy, I'm assuming here, I don't obviously know, but but if he's a popular sales trainer or whatever, a lot of people, nonetheless, to get into the program, the sacrifices to get into the program, but somebody probably sees working for this guy, Andy Elliott, as their dream job because they're like, I want to be around these super successful people that are going to make me rich. Meanwhile, he probably got him, makes a good deal of his money off of telling other people they're going to get rich. It's just like the old newspaper ad thing of, um, send me $10 and I will show you how to become a millionaire. And then they're like, well, the steps are putting that in the newspaper and ask people to send you $10 to find out how to become a millionaire. Obviously, that's like a pyramid scheme type thing. That isn't what this is. Um, but kind of fits in the same in the same way. And there are people that are, would be willing to do anything to work for this guy to fulfill their dreams of getting rich. Um, and it feeds into the emotional manipulation, potentially. Um, and there's a lot of sacrifice that, that goes into it. And I, I, I don't want to accuse anybody of, of anything, but Let's say you had your dream job coming up. You had like your absolute dream job who you really want to work for. Um, you really need the money and they tell you you need to get a six pack for the job. Of course, there are people that will they'll sue. You'll have people that are, that are smart and they'll do that. But if you're really desperate for it, um, you might just go ahead and you're like, I really want to make this. I really want to prove myself. And you'll find any means necessary to get there. And that any means necessary may be things that are not necessarily natural. It may be substances, performance-enhancing substances. It may be getting on an Ozempic even, something like that. It could be something like a – there's like a tongue patch surgery that some people get in order to drop weight quickly because generally like getting abs is a function of – getting down to the absolute lowest body fat percentage possible and you have to go down to really low calories in many cases to get that sort of definition. Um, and your willingness to do that is at this point a barometer for how much you are willing to lay yourself prostrate. Even though you're looking all strong up there, th these people are under submission perhaps to this 
to this Elliot guy. And he is then seeing that as a test of your obedience to him and also to your ability to, to, to deprive yourself. So in the last episode, we talked about asceticism. Of course, these are very, very difficult things to do. Um, and it could be just a test of asceticism, um, a test of how much you're willing to deprive yourself. And that is a big theme that we're going to see. And I'm going to get into it more in next week's episode. But that, but asceticism and being able to completely deprive yourself is something that they're looking for. And it is partially to get you to blame yourself because let's say you try your best to get through this thing. You try to do things naturally and you've been working out for months and months and months. You've been be dieting and all of that. And of course, he specifically says clean eating. And I think that the reason why that is, is again, the asceticism stuff that's been going around in the whole success community and that's kind of going against the whole trend of if if it's your macros, which has been honestly one of the biggest triumphs for inclusion in the fitness space because now people who have different food availability, different life circumstances, they can adjust their diets. But now we're sort of seeing as like a clean eating as sort of a morality thing. I think it was Dr. Lane Norton who said that nutrition is in a way replacing morality. Um, But let's say you're that person and you just keep not being able to do it and then you look at yourself and you're like, okay, now I'm just going to blame myself for the fact that I'm not economically successful because I could not get myself below 10% body fat. That means I'm a weak, lazy loser who will never be successful in life and it's my fault. And that, of course, is an impediment to solidarity. Because you're there, you're blaming yourself for your weight, and you're blaming yourself for your lack of financial success because this guy says they're connected. And they are connected, but just in the opposite way of how you think. I want to get the term social determinants of physique out there. Um, you, it, it is a thing where getting that specific, very, very lean look, which oftentimes it can be manipulation and you're not going to stay at that level year round. Honestly, you're not. You're you're probably not going to be able to maintain that low of a level year round. And it's not just a matter of working out and doing all the right things. It, it is a matter of either very very strategic implementation and needing some of these specialized coaching programs, or possibly needing substances, or just being able to be incredibly incredibly strict with yourself in terms of in terms of diet, in terms of training. Um. And it is it is a form of it it is a form of gatekeeping. Um, what what I've noticed is is that you have you have this specific you have this specific type of look that you are supposed to be aiming for in order to be seen as successful, and it's just another impediment to inclusion. It is this specific look that is associated with success, just like the way we've associated success with white men in general, as opposed to people of color, women, um, all the other types of, all the other isms of discrimination. Um, This is the same thing, is that we are basically, we are putting up in our mind now this image that spaces of economic opportunity are only for strong men who look a certain way and act a certain way. Um, but that's not totally true. It's not totally true in real life. Look at Donald Trump, who is allegedly six foot three, 215 pounds. And that has been the joke of the internet ever since he was booked in the Fulton County jail. It's not true. It's that the social determinants of physique make it more likely that if you have a ton of money, you're going to be able to get this very specific look. If you're more of a working class person who's managing your own training, having to deal with get, going to the gym late at night after a long shift or getting up early in the morning before a long shift at work, the fact that you're going to be on the road occasionally with things, you're going to need to slip up a bit in terms of fast food, you can still get to an excellent look. And I absolutely encourage it. I will say that I definitely believe in the benefits of using fitness as a way of boosting your confidence. So this general principle, though I may not agree with it in a super specific way, um, the way that he says that, 
And especially the way he says here that if somebody says, I'm depressed, if they'll just go to the gym for 30 days, 60 days, they'll never be depressed again. I can tell you from personal experience, that is not true. Yes, it can absolutely help. And I believe that's a good thing. And I think that the kayfabe can be used in your advantage. That if you get yourself to a more, to a better level of fitness, 100%, you can use that as a way to motivate yourself to do other things. I love the warrior stuff. I love the whole turning yourself into a much stronger warrior, a stronger man, and using that as a way to become more confident. Just like just like you would in a wrestling ring, you have somebody who is ready for they're ready for their for their championship run. They're stronger, more confident on the mic, more confident on the ring, and they look like they're in really good shape. Um, ahead of their ahead of your pay per view, where you're going to overcome everything, but it doesn't necessarily have to be the perfection that everybody else says in wrestling. Imperfect people in in a field where you're literally judged based upon how your body looks, um, and where the most prominent man in that field for a long time was a big bodybuilding enthusiast, Vince McMahon, who had a very specific look they curated. AEW, Tony Khan, that whole movement has changed things quite a bit, all the way up to the point where you have Sami Zayn and Kevin Owens, WWE Tag Team Champions, um, who don't really fit that that bill. But look, they're still successful. Um, so it's not an it's not a total rule in life or in wrestling, but it is a specific image, and that specific image and the tactic of the heel populist is to get you to believe that if only you can join them and you can become them, then and only then you can become the successful person who can fight and win. If you conform to what they want, that's the only way that you can get what you want out of life. Meanwhile, the reality is there is some truth to what they're saying. Fitness does improve your confidence. It, heck, having a lean core, having a lean tight midsection does improve your confidence quite a bit when you're at that point, and I've even experienced this myself. When you, when you are able to like get a nice fitting pair of pair of jeans, or you're able to fit well into your into your swimwear, that is a confidence boost. And there is a thing, certainly for for men in particular, um, of feeling strong like that, and that can transfer into other areas of your life. I believe in that, and I I do train regularly. I do try my best to watch my nutrition, um, and I do feel a benefit from it. But it is not an abs- a, a total determinant of success. Um, there are other factors in it. There, there are confounding variables here. And really what you should seek to do is achieve the physique you want to achieve and get yourself to a level where you feel confident about it and then that will transfer over whatever that is for you. And I will, I, I will conclude um, part of this with the or the way the the article concludes. It does say that 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 his that the rule isn't exactly it isn't exactly what you would um, that. It isn't as dramatic, I guess. And he's he's complaining about people complaining about it, of course. Um, he's saying 90% of his team has six-pack. Um, he says you're given a certain period of time. It's not like a total rule, like 100% if you, don't, if you won't get hired. He's saying these hired people who were overweight, but then he gets them. But then they get into shape while they're working for him. Um, so with that little bit of disclaimer there, and you can read the exact statements in that in that New York Post article, which I will link in the description. Um, but still, we have this lingering we we do have this lingering issue, and there are definitely this isn't the first one to to do this. Um, there are a lot of like coaching programs out there. I a few episodes ago I mentioned the Ultimate Performance Gym. Very expensive gym, like five thousand dollar personal training programs. There was another program out there called Built Lean that's very targeted to this demographic of success bros and success people, um, and they all portray like a specific fitness model type image. The latest one um, that I saw is actually 
is this one called Invictus um, Fitness. And that was, it was very, very explicit about this. Um, so I wanted to actually, I wanted to share it because there is literally fi- advertisements for fitness professionals that specifically say that they are for um, quote unquote finance bros. And I did find just before I started this episode, the connection in um, back to this toxic masculinity and this political stuff very explicitly. Um, although he says it's a joke. Um, so this ad that I saw pop up um, says, Finance Bros, if I offered to show you how to get trade in 2023 without counting, counting calories or living on board, bird food, of course, this guy actually seems pretty reasonable in his diet approach because he's saying, you without missing out on after work drinks, without spending hours in the gym, without any of the guesswork, um, I'll be personally, he's specifically saying 10 guys who work in finance. So you have people who, and then he says specifically, transformation coach for guys in finance is how this guy, Ben Lecter of Invictus Fitness, signs this thing. Um, This is a very specific vein of fitness that is going around that is targeted. Of course, the targeting, the demographic is going to be because of the fact that people who can afford certain training programs. Um, but there, but the ultimate performance thing was also started by somebody who worked in finance and you're seeing a lot of the tech people getting into these self-optimization biohacking. You're even seeing a really buff Jeff Bezos. So this image, it is going around there beyond this one guy. This is a pretty sizable cultural trend that is going on and it is further perpetuating this image, um, And what I don't want to see is, and I always, whenever I do these types of analyses, I always give a sort of disclaimer. I don't want this to be the thing that's like, okay, this gives me license to never care about my fitness ever again. Um, I'm just saying there are multiple ways to get to a confident, good level of fitness. And they're always going to show you their highlights. They're never going to show the person who actually fails these things. Of course not. They're not going to show you the transformation of that person. It makes sense for their business. Um, to show only the successful people in these types of programs. And of course, it is, again, self-selecting. So it may not even be that this program is superior to other programs or any other program is superior to other programs. It is that they're selecting. And this is why, like, sometimes when I hear personal trainers, fitness coaches say, oh, yes, the people who pay more money for programs are more committed, and that's why they get better results. I'm like, do you know what confounding variables are? That person probably has more time, more resources, probably can also pay for a meal prep service in addition to your training. Um, Maybe they they probably have a job that offers them more time off. They're not as stressed out about money. Um, Ties back into some of the fitness people, or not the fitness people, the finance people online who are shaming poor people for getting fast food. It's not the fast food that is making somebody poor. It is the circumstances that are causing them to be under stress that are making them poor and they're making them into somebody who is um, craving a lot of fast food or that only has that as a resource. And the interesting part is a, a TikToker named King Frenchy, who I really like, um, although I disagree with some of his political positions, he does have a bit of a different view on certain issues than I do. Um, but he was explaining basically how processed food availability Im- improves productivity because you don't have to constantly be – because you have the ability to quickly grab food after working a 12, 14 hour shift. Um, but we'll get to that more on the productivity related episodes um, coming up soon. Um, but it is, it, it is this image that is being portrayed out there and it is being used for gatekeeping very explicitly now. But what I'm afraid of is that it's being used in the reverse is that they're like, okay, well, look, you're poor, you're fat, you're, <laughs> you, it's because you lack discipline. The reason why you are poor is because you lack discipline. Evidence for that is look at your body, you're fat, or even if you look at a guy like me, like they'll say, oh yeah, you're not disciplined because there's still a little bit of, there's still some fat covering your lower abs, your abs aren't like popping out. That shows that you're undisciplined and that's the reason why you're not rich when its correlation does not equal causation, of course. And this is the new frontier of poor shaming. I have to do more episodes on this whole biohacking trend as well. 
Um, but that is sort of where we're going. And that is definitely, that's a heel tactic. That's a villain tactic is, is shaming somebody. If you watch a wrestling show and MJF of AEW, he's sort of turned around. He has this really interesting relationship and connection with Adam Cole, um, who are friends in the dark order (laughs) call budge, which leads me a very interesting joke. I think that we need to possibly, instead of trying nudge policies in politics, we got to try some budge policies, some Adam Cole baby in our politics. But uh, but I don't blame you if you didn't laugh at that. Um, But Adam Cole and MJF, Adam Cole was heavily body shamed, hence that little remark that I mentioned in the beginning of the episode, including by MJF. And they always like they'll they'll look in the crowd. And they're like all of you fat poor people, heels, villains in wrestling shows. So all you fat poor people, look at you, and you're cheering for this guy. And that's happening. That's going to happen in politics too. Um, they're like oh, all of you fat poor people. There certainly is the fat shaming with the whole body positivity thing being associated with the left and the progressive side. Which body positivity is absolutely necessary. Um, but the right capitalizes on it and uses a ton of fat shaming, even though look at Donald Trump and all of that. Enough said. But that will be continued to use. They're like, okay, the evidence for why it is your fault that you are not successful in life is if you look at your body. But I say, um, not just the way Adam Cole says it, look at your body of work and not your body. Look at the body of work of the politicians that are and the business people who are making the policies to oppress people in lower income situations so that they are both unable to achieve things economically and also unable to achieve things in terms of health and fitness. But somebody could hear that same message and they could be like, if they're working on their fitness or whatever, they're like, I'm better than those people. Look at me right now. Even though I'm flat broke, I am starving myself every day to try to see my six pack while I'm working this guy's success sales training program and I'm going to become so successful in life because I'm living up to that. And look at all those poor people over there that are sitting there collecting welfare and they're not working hard enough to improve themselves. And I can see that because of how fat they are. And that is what the song, the country song, Rich Men, North of Richmond would have you believe they're talking about the overweight welfare people i should have had the exact lyric um up there but rich men north of richmond basically this song by this guy um this guy um oliver anthony uh rails against taxes welfare cheats and the obese according to independent um and it's been praised by people on the right even though he says it's not quite associated with the right and then it says here, um, I'm trying to get to the lyric about, but but basically it's fat. It's 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 both the talking negatively about politicians, but then also talking negatively about overweight people who are sitting down. Oh yes, there it is. And the obese milk and welfare. Well, God, if you're five foot three and you're three hundred pounds, taxes ought not to pay for your bags of fudge rounds. So look. Instead of going, he well, he is saying that he's going after the rich men in politics, but he's basically doing their bidding with that line by causing you to blame your fellow man for their problem. the The obese guy's fudge rounds are not your are not remotely taking out as much from the budget as um, tax cheats are. So that false equivalency, at a minimum, is detrimental to our politics. And it's creating, again, this is a populistic song that's talking about a lot of struggles of the working class from a guy who's a farmer out in Virginia, um, factory worker. But it is, in fact, using that heel shaming tactic, that heel populism that I talked about in my article about MJF last year that causes you to villainize your fellow man. And that is a concerning strain that we are going to see popping up more and more in politics, especially as the Republicans try to hijack the economic narrative and say that Bidenomics is not working. So another thing we have to 
we have to keep an eye out for and try to try to mitigate as we can. And in terms of this Richmond North of Richmond song, I feel like I could probably do a whole episode on it. But what I am going to say is I trust the anxious millennial cowboy from Aaron's Creek, Virginia, a lot more than Oliver Anthony. And he has a really good country music playlist. Hangman Adam Page of AEW, one of my favorite pro wrestlers of all time. Um, he has a great country playlist, and he's he rotates the playlist a bit, but he has a lot of um, more progressive country music. There is an interesting strain of country, even even going into like Willie Nelson in the older stuff. That's very much that's very, that's pretty progressive. Um, uh, some of my work on Adam Page covers that. I'll link to that article again in the description of this episode. Um, but there's a, there's a really good strain of country music. Like uh, The artists that I've been into are like Orville Peck, Cody Jinks, Pawns or Kings. Um, there's a lot of good country music that that has progressive themes to it. And conservatives have sort of co-opted it for... Um, their own political gain, especially with Rich Men North of Richmond, and try try that in a small town um, through this through this summer. Um, and of course, this is definitely falling into that heel populism pattern. You are going to the working class people who are oppressed by these by the conservative policies, the ones who are getting kicked off of Medicaid because of these conservative policies. But no, you're not vilifying the people who are taking away your Medicaid. You are vilifying the person who is eating a few too many fudge rounds, in your opinion. Um, but again, as w- we have to be careful in terms of progressive messaging and saying that, saying that yes, we do care about fitness, and yes, doing fitness stuff, being in really good shape, can be amazing, and it can improve your fitness, can really improve your confidence, and I'd encourage you to. Pursue an excellent to pursue an excellent physique at the top of your potential to get to that level because it does make you feel better. It does improve your confidence. It can improve your health. Um, fitness is something that you can modify more based on your own effort rather than other physical characteristics. Although again, there are social determinants of physique, but I do believe in that, and I believe in creating creating yourself into the kind of warrior you want to be. You don't have to conform to the way the villains and the enemies want you to be. You can become your own character and your own version of a champion and stand tall and be confident in that. And as Adam Page says, let's all keep working on bettering ourselves, but you're always good enough for full gear. So you can be confident even if you're not quite at that six-pack level and you don't have to blame yourself and shame yourself and view your physique as being the reason why you are economically not doing well and understand the very real role of economic oppression while continuing to work on yourself and become better as a person. All right, so um, thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this episode. I'm going to be covering more on this uh, on on this idea of the right wanting you to basically shame and doubt yourself and shame others instead of going after who's really causing the problems and this kayfabe of success bros. I'm going to be watching AEW All In Pro Wrestling this weekend. Um, it's going to be an amazing wrestling weekend. Uh, please follow me on social media at Fixer Punk on TikTok and Instagram, at Grayson Nation, G-R-E-Y-S-O-N-N-A-T-I-O-N on Twitter or X. Um, and if you have any comments about this episode, if you have any crazy workplace experiences, um, crazy experiences with success bros or success experts or any of these kinds of possible scams or people that are taking advantage of other people, please give me a call. Tell me your story. Leave a voicemail on the toll-free number 844-477-PUNK, 844-477-7865. And I hope you will join me again next week for the next episode. This content is for entertainment and general informational purposes only. We do not warrant or guarantee the accuracy of the information herein. 
If you suspect any medical or mental health concern, please promptly consult a qualified physician. The listener should not rely solely upon this content and consult a competent professional before deciding to follow any course of action.